So this is our session one, the overview of legislation. It's the first session in the PPE prep group series. And I'm gonna talk you through a little bit about how legislation works when it comes to the PPE exam. So all of our lectures are going to be structured in this particular way. It's going to be a diagram and the diagram is going to be broken up into three parts. And these are just overviews. It's not everything you need to know about the section. It's just to give you a general understanding so you don't feel so uncomfortable or so scared of the paper. So in legislation, this is generally ascribed to paper one. If I had to give you uh, some sort of explanation of what's in paper one and paper two, in paper one of the PPE exam, or the professional practice exam, you're going to mainly talk about the reasons why SACAP, or the South African Council for the Architectural Profession, has come into place, the, the things that they are in charge of, and a lot about professional conduct. So a lot about paper one is about you as a practicing professional, the practice of architecture, how to ensure your relationships between yourselves and clients are seen in a professional manner, um, how, um, for example, would you be dealt with if there was misconduct? Um, how to start your own firm? A lot of this information that's mentioned here is about the practice of architecture. In paper two, we don't really talk about the practice of architecture so much, but what we're talking about in paper two is more about contracts and law. Law about construction is more what we're talking about. And how is the architect involved in this process or the architectural designer? I'm gonna talk a little bit here on this diagram about legislation, post apartheid South Africa, the Constitutional Act, and the Council for the Built Environment. But what I want you to know is that information changes all the time, particularly when things get revised or a new law uh, is, is, is released um, or something new is enacted. All of these things change. So it's important for you to always go and check out the most recent information. At this moment in time, to my knowledge, this is the most accurate uh, information I have to represent. And so I'm going to give you what I know at this moment in time. But let's go through it. So legislation is what we're talking about. We're going to look on at post-apartheid South Africa and how the context informed what the law looks like now. And then moving on from there, why the context informed what the Constitutional Act is like, and moving on from there, how the Constitutional Act gave birth to the Council of the Built Environment and what that means for us as architectural professionals. So let's move through this. Before we do that, at the beginning of every lecture, you will see there's a thing called new concepts. This is probably concepts, especially if you haven't done professional practice in university, you would not have seen before. And so I'm trying to give you a heads up on the things you need to get your head around. Because if you understand these, you would most likely be able to understand what's going on in the paper a lot better. So legislature, coming from the word legislation, it's laws, it's things, documents that has been written which govern the country. These laws which govern the country are based on a couple of things. They are based in South Africa on three things, really. They're based on the Roman Dutch law, some of the British law, and some of the traditional law. Common law, which we're going to get to just now, talks a little bit more about how the um, laws which are not, say, specifically mentioned uh, or aren't outrightly mentioned, how things are governed when it isn't specifically mentioned in legislation. We're then going to talk about the courts who are, according to region, who enforce things uh, and who enforce acts and policies uh, in, in, the, um, in the specific regions. And then we talk about this idea of natural persons and juristic persons. So natural person is, for example, you, if you are not a machine listening to this, but you who is a person that is born like as a human being from another person. A juristic person or uh, a juristic entity is one that has been created because of legislation. And we're going to, so these ideas I'm talking to you about is stuff you need to research more, find out more about it, and then uh, proceed. So here we go. These are the new concepts that we've spoken about. Now let's talk about post apartheid South Africa because that was our first part. So in post apartheid South Africa, the context behind that is that South Africa was colonized before. So South Africa was colonized by the British. And subsequently, a lot of those oppressive regimes somehow filtered down into apartheid South Africa. Now, as generally South Africa is infamous for apartheid, but apartheid was a law which discriminated against people of color. And so post-apartheid South Africa, once uh, apartheid had been um, disbanded, abolished, uh, had been completely stopped, there was a new move in the country to move towards a progressive future. So a lot of our laws in South Africa are amongst 
the most progressive laws in, in, in the world. Um, I'm not a lawyer by any chance, but I'm giving you the context of, of, um, of um, law from an architectural perspective, or at least the way that I understand. These are my insights, my observations, my analysis. So I'm going to try to explain to you in a way that might not necessarily be um, the way someone who is practicing law would say it, but I'm telling, you, telling it to you from the perspective of the way I understand it and the way that has allowed me and enabled me to be able to work through this examination. Moving away from colonization, moving to post-apartheid South Africa, the Roman Dutch common law and traditional law or customary law or the law of the people in the land is what makes up the constitution. So if you had to think about it, whenever a place is colonized, the views of the colonizers are imprinted, are left on those people in that particular place. And so that's why in South Africa, we have the Roman Dutch and the common law, which is influenced by the British. So all of the, the kind of colonizers that were here that had, uh, in, uh, ha had um, allowed these laws to, to be enacted in the land is what we followed until post-apartheid South Africa. Because in post-apartheid South Africa, we said, okay, let's take what's good from those laws and let's merge it with our traditional customs. Because the plan of colonization or what can be perceived as a plan of colonization is to bring one nation's belief systems and values into another and ensure that entire land follows that same set. And so it almost serves to wipe out um, indigenous populations. So the indigenous population of South Africa had attempted to preserve this law and they preserve it through the customary or traditional laws, which now make up the constitution. So the constitution is made up of Roman Dutch, common law and traditional law. Now, the constitution is the highest law in the land. And so this is, this is legislation. It is legislation which tells us, and if you uh, are from uh, or had studied in South Africa, you'd know probably right about grade four, we learned about rights and responsibilities. And the Constitutional Act talks about those things, uh, the, the, the rights and responsibilities of people, and there's uh, the Freedom Charter, there's a lot of information you can read and check out yourself, but the Constitutional Act talks about the constitutional rights of people in South Africa. The Constitutional Act also talks a lot about um, other things as well, which we're going to get into. So the Constitutional Act is Act number 108 of 1996. South Africa, apartheid, ended 94. Post-apartheid is anything coming after 94. So you can see the constitution was enacted in 1996. It's Act 108 of 1996. Heads up for you. Time for you to memorize that stuff. That's the attitude you should always have towards the PPE exam. You don't need to have so much experience to write the exam. You need to have, in my opinion, confidence. And you can get confidence by understanding what's going on. So when you see an act, memorize that act because they're going to ask you about those acts in the paper. So whenever you see act whatever of whatever, memorize the number of the act in the year in which it was established and understand the context around which it was formed. So the Constitution Act came after apartheid, and so it was a more progressive act, is to try to be more inclusive and more transformational in its nature. So Act 108 of 1996 is what we're looking at, the Constitutional Act, and the Constitutional Act gave birth to a whole number of other acts, and one of those is the CIDB. And this particular act with the Construction Integration Development Board, um, I think that's a correct um, um, acronym for it, I'll check up and let you know for sure. But this particular, this particular um, act, uh, number 38 of 2000, was an act that was established to integrate, to move the construction industry forward into creating a progressive South Africa. Because remember, under the Group Areas Act, which was an act that was created under apartheid, people of color, had to all be separated from people who were uh, of white origin or who were white settlers. They were separated from the people of color. And so there was a, a large spatial disparity uh, between uh, different races. And so, for example, you'd have that people of color had to work far from the CPD on the outskirts of the urban environment. And so there needed to be a spatial transformation to try and bring everybody back together again or link up all of these nodes. That's why we have townships now, uh, if you didn't know. So the CIDB, uh, the, the, this particular act that had come into play, was set to create connections between the space or to, to overcome, to eradicate some of the wrong done by apartheid. And how was this going to happen? Who are the people that are in the construction industry? Some of the people that were in the construction industry are people like us, architectural technologists, um, construction professionals, or professionals, we'll get to the word professionals just now, um, uh, engineers, uh, quantity surveyors, uh, property evaluators, all of us are the role players that make up 
the construction industry or the AEC industry on construction. And so the players of this construction industry needed to be regulated. And so the Council for the Built Environment Act number 43 of 2000 was established. And so just to give you a summary on this one, there's a constitutional act, act number 108 of 1996, which gave birth to the CIDB Act, which gave birth to the CBE, the Council of the Built Environment Act or the Council for the Built Environment Act. And this particular act regulates how all of us perform, how all of us act, how all of us behave in our profession. Just look at the numbers there. It's following the sequence, apart from 108 of 1996, look at 2000. In the year 2000, there was Act 38, following on until we got to Act number 43, which gave birth to all of these acts in the next slide. So the Council of the Building Environment, I'm only showing three here, but there's more than that. I'm showing you three so that you can just get a gist, just an idea of what's going on. So the Council for the Built Environment, Act number 44 of 2000, is for the architectural profession. So just look at the numbers. Act number 43 was a Council for the Built Environment, and Act number 44 is for the architectural profession. The architectural, the architectural professionals act is one that was uh, had taken over or had come after the Architects Act of 1970. Now, the Architects Act of 1970 was only focused on architects and it only governed architects. It didn't govern other people in the profession. And it almost, to some degree, you could say, was allowing there to only be architects in the profession and no draftspersons or technologists or senior technologists. And so when the Architectural Professional Act had come out uh, of number 44 of 2000, by the way, memorize this, it established a juristic body, a juristic person, a juristic entity called SACA, the South African Council for the Architectural Profession. Now we talk about profession. The idea of a profession is not someone that has such a high degree of integrity in their work or is so good at doing it that you call them a professional. The word profession means it had to be legislated by law, legislated coming from legislature, it has to exist by law. SACAP, 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 SACAP exists because of the law. The law says SACAP must exist. And so SACAP has now established a profession. And a profession, if you want to understand it, say perhaps in a more simplistic sense, is any field of work that has a responsibility to the public. So an architect, because we're creating structures, or an architectural designer needs to ensure that the buildings they have do some duties, it mustn't fall, the environment around it must be good, it must be healthy conditions for people, there must be anthropometrics taken into account and a whole range of things as you would know. A professional is someone that belongs to a profession. So you can't be a professional barber or a professional hairdresser according to what is stated here. You can be a professional if the law states that you belong to a profession. And so there are bodies that were created to regulate, to ensure that everybody follows the law. SACAP is one of those bodies. Other bodies like that is the Landscape Professions Act and the Engineering Professions Act. And they are governed by SACAP and ICSA. So there's an act that comes into place and who ensures that everything under the act um, is followed, the, the professional bodies that are established, SACAP, SACAP, ICSA, whatever the case is. But look at the numbers and why I show you these particular ones, because 44, 45, 46 are probably the professions you can remember the easiest. Architectural profession, landscape profession, engineering profession. SACAP have, has a, an annual report. You can look at it. There's a 2020-2021 report. The next diagram I'm going to show you is from this particular report. This diagram is quite a cool diagram because what it shows you is it shows you the Council for the Built Environment as the higher body, Act number 43. It then shows you Act number 44, the Council for the Built Environment, and all the other acts going up to number 48. Uh, there's actually all the way up to, sorry, number 49 or 48. For whatever reason, I don't know why it's not put in order, but this is how the diagram is. Um, I've labeled and put numbers on there for your ease of reference, but you can see it here, the Council for the Built Environment, established SACAP, established the, the Council for the Quantity Surveying Provision, established ICSA, Engineering Council, established SACLAP, Landscape, established um, the Council of Property value, Valuers, and also uh, Project Construction Management Professionals. These are all the bodies, the juristic persons that have been created to regulate the profession. On the top, you can see I've got a little star there. This is for you just to help you members remember stuff if you're finding it difficult to remember. If you think L epic is like, it's very epic or L-E-P-P-Q, that um, acronym stands for 
Architectural Professions Act, that's number 44. The Landscape Professions Act, that's number 45. Then Engineering, number 46. Then the next P, which is number 47, is the uh, Property Valuers. Then number 48, um, the next P is the Project Managers. And uh, number 49 is the Quantity Surveyors. Just so you know, maybe it'll help you. I don't know. Sharing whatever I know to help you here. So this is an overview of how the law has uh, created these bodies to enforce our professions. And the major ideas that you need to take away from here, apart from the things you need to memorize, are these concepts on the top. Legislature, what is common law? Um, and by the way, if you just want to know what is common law based on, uh, and this came out in the 2021 paper, common law is based on precedent. It means things that have already happened, uh, they kind of formalize it. And so like, because it's happened this way, it needs to continue happening this way in future, unless it needs to be revised under a new case, someone versus someone, whatever the case is. So legislature, common law, the courts, natural person, juristic person, entity, these are the concepts you need to get familiar with because these concepts allow you to understand what is to follow uh, in this particular um, presentation. What I'd like to point out to you is that a lot of the things I mentioned to you have come out in past papers, and so it most likely will come out again. But for you to know, specifically now, because it's come out in the recent years, and I'm looking here for a 2022 paper, the idea of the courts, there are several courts in South Africa. At this moment in time, we have courts that are ranked as a hierarchy, and which is the highest court in the land. The highest court in the land is the constitutional court. It's this one we mentioned here, the constitution and constitutional act. But under that, we have the, the, the Supreme Court, and then we have the high courts. And then it continues and follows that direction. If you look into the resources folder which are provided, you will find some information on this. Learn this. This is a question that's featured before. There's also questions about how many high courts are there in the country. From what I saw today when I read the link that I shared with everyone, there are 14 high courts in the country. These courts enforce and ensure that the law is enacted correctly in a specific um, area. And so memorize those, go over it, because one of the, the key parts of paper one, I wouldn't say is perhaps that you need to have had experience. Maybe like 20% of the paper is based on you having experience and you perhaps getting a distinction. But the rest of the paper, in my opinion, is a lot about memorizing and not memorizing without understanding, but memorizing and understanding. That will differentiate you. So the next time we, uh, the next time we join uh, together, we're going to get an overview of paper two, and then we'll talk about contracts, and we'll talk a little bit more about the construction contracts. But this is just an overview of what paper one is about, one section of paper one. Paper one talks a lot about the way an architect um, behaves and the way an architect practices, but we'll talk a little bit more about this with specific examples when we are doing past papers. For now, just get a good grip on these particular, um, uh, these particular points that are made. And in the next one, we'll talk about the construction system or the construction contracts.